aperture. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Denise Wolf, and I'm a senior editor at Aperture. For those of you who are not familiar with Aperture, it was founded in 1952 by a group of artists, writers, and curators as a common ground for photography. Um, Aperture Today is a multi-platform publisher that unites the photography community in print, in person, and online. Uh, today, we are thrilled to be joined by Mark Seeley, Dr. Kenneth Montague, Family Burke, and Richard Mark Rollins to celebrate the newly published book, As We Rise, Photography from the Black Atlantic. This event is the second in our online series where we discuss the various themes and chapters from uh, As We Rise. Um, you can watch a recording of the first talk with Thelma Golden on Aperture's YouTube channel or by following the link in the chat. And make sure to tune in on December 9th at 7 p.m. Eastern time to watch the final talk, which will focus on the theme of identity. Um, I promise you that the talk will be much more exciting than this introduction, but I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the book and also about each of our panelists tonight. Um, a little bit about the book, uh, Mark Seeley titled his introduction, um, A Gathering of Souls. Uh, and so that gives you a, a window into what this is about. Um, to quote from his introduction, the collection of photographs gathered here signposts a different direction of travel for the black subject. This collection places the black subject front, back, and center stage in photography as producers and as equal subjects of inquiry. Here, the black body is not a distant bag carrier, an emaciated victim, or a broken war-torn figure rendered only as dead history. Here, the black subject is a living, inspiring, loving, and aspirational subject, innovative and full of knowledge, transforming and claiming their right place in time. The Wedge Collection points to a place of pleasure and challenges the old discourses surrounding photography's history. I think that really gets to the heart of the book, and I hope today's discussion is a gathering of souls as well. Um, today's discussion will be moderated by Mark Seeley, um, who he has been the director of Autograph ABP, which stands for Associated Association of Black Photographers in the UK, um, since 1991 and has produced numerous artist publications, curated exhibitions, and commissioned photographers and filmmakers worldwide. He curated the exhibition From Here to Eternity, Sunil Gupta, a retrospective at the Photographer's Gallery and in uh, Ryerson Image Center, Toronto. And he's the author of the book, Decolonizing the Camera, Photography in Racial Time. Seeley holds a PhD from Durham University, England, and currently serves as Principal Research Fellow Decolonizing Photography at University of the Arts, London. I'm pleased also to introduce our panelists for the evening. Um, Dr. Kenneth Montague started the Wedge Collection in 1997 to acquire and exhibit art that explores Black identity. In addition to the Wedge Collection, Montague founded Wedge Curatorial Projects, a nonprofit arts organization that helps to support Black, Black artists. A Toronto-based art collector, Montague has been a member of the um, Art Gallery of Ontario's Board of Trustees since 2015. He has served on the African Acquisitions Committee at Tate Modern London and is the advisor to the Department of Arts of Global Africa and the Diaspora at the Art Gallery of Ontario. Um, Family Burke, who's also joining us, is, all, is often described as the godfather of Black British photography, whereby his iconic images have captured the evolving cultural landscape, social change, and encouraged debate in the United Kingdom over the past four decades. His body of work re represents one of the largest photographic records of the Caribbean diaspora in Britain. And as an avid collector, Burke continues to connect histories through his substantial archived house at the Library of Birmingham, um, from local community organizations to the Victoria and Albert Museum and Whitechapel, Burke has exhibited widely in the United Kingdom and as far as field as New York, South Africa, and China. Also joining us, Richard Mark Rawlings. Rawlins is a graduate of the RCA print program um, in 2019. Rawlins research takes a transnational approach to the pop cultural, pop cultural poetics and pol politics of life in the Caribbean, the contested and resultant history slash realities of colonialism and its transpontine consequence, Black identity and diaspora politics. 
Rollins' work has been featured in the Drawing Biennial in 2021, um, the Human Touch, Making Art, Leaving Traces, the Fitzwilliam Museum, Cambridge, uh, Ingram Prize, Wells Art Contemporary, Photo Fringe, and the Trinidad, Trinidad and Tobago Film Festival. His work has been acquired by the Wedge Collection, um, AMBA Collection London, the Soho House Art Collection in London, and the Art Collection of the Central Bank of Trinidad and Tobago. Tonight's program is supported in part by generous donations from um, Aperture's Board of Trustees, our members, and other individuals. Aperture's programs are made possible in part by the New York State Council on the Arts with support from the New York State Legislature. Additional support for As We Rise was provided by Drs. Frederick and Liza Morrell, Dawood Bay, and John Ellis. Please be sure to put any questions you may have in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, and we'll get to them towards the end of the evening. Now I'd like to hand it over to Mark Seeley. Thank you so much. Wow, thanks, Denise. That's such a generous and kind set of introductions, and it's, and it's just lovely to be in the room. Um, and it was on, 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 and in a place to talk about, you know, such a great collection, which I feel as though I've been, what's the word, connected to since very, very early in, in, in its day. I mean, I think Ken and I met in, uh, in, in East London and he arrived kind of out the blue, enthusiastic, you know, energized. I was usually stressed and impatient. But Ken was a rare gem. He was someone who actually wanted to collect work by photographers that weren't necessarily celebrity figures at the time, that were working in very, what I would call difficult conditions, surviving. But what Ken did really, I think, in terms of the work was join the dots. He had a mission, he had a vision. And I think once you've got a mission and a vision, you can begin to share that and get people on board. And I think the conversations after a very short time, I began to realize that, well, number one, we shared a passion for music. And number two, we shared a passion for vision and visual material that can change the dynamic in terms of how black people have been seen historically, especially within the field of photography. And I think it was clearly absent from many of the big and larger institutions, this wonderful bodies of work would have been, that have been produced, you could argue since you know, post-World War II, that there was huge gaps. And I'm not quite sure how those gaps were filled, but I think part of it was intuition. And I do believe a word which I'm coming to more and more is a sense of passion. And I think when there's passion and love on the table, the difficult things become easy to clear. You can push them away. They don't hold you back. And I think there's so many obstacles, whether they're financial, institutional, structural. But what I sense from Ken, like my work at Autograph in many ways, is a learning curve, trying to go forward, trying to build things, and importantly, trying to leave something behind. And I think one of the, it, the, the dark side of that is that it's absolutely critical work. It's work that needed to be done. And it's work that needs to be done still. And I would argue that we're still at the very, what's the word, still at the very beginning of this journey. Because each year that goes by, each moment that happens, there's more and more good things to be, dis I don't like the word discovered because it's part of a kind of colonial narrative, but more, more things to be in conversation with. And I think that's what's been absolutely critical about this work. And then when I look through and I had the opportunity to see myself, some of the images that Ken had collected over time, I was still learning what was there. I was still seeing how, and trying to join the dots across that arc of, uh, it's, they're like incisions, aren't they, in a conversation. They're like incisions which say, by the way, consider this folks, by the way, consider that. And that's a good curatorial place to absolutely begin. Rather than giving people the answers, I prefer it when we have a project that says, can you, can you please consider this visual gift I'm giving you? And I think what Ken has done is given the world an aperture of done through this book, an incredible gift to start all kinds of different conversations, which is why I was so proud and so, so pleased to be involved in the conversation. So I think that's a kind of little introduction from me and I'm just gonna pass over to Ken 
um, to give us a little bit more insight, especially around these chapters. I like the word chapters, missing chapters, like the idea of chronicles, black stories, like the idea of narratives. So I think part of what I just want to say as well is that this is part of a global story. This is part of a world story. And I think, yes, it's got a very particular focus, but it's also something that grows into and should be inserted into the wider narrative of visual representational politics about who we are and what it means to be human in this day and age. So Kenneth, a little bit about the book and a little bit about the process, please. Thank you so much, Mark. You're a good friend. And I have to say, I don't know if uh, I can be, uh, well, you won't be outdone here. I must say, <laughs> you're, you're a wonderful speaker too. I keep forgetting we're, we're such good friends and we have these private conversations, but you are uh, uh, a leader in the field and someone who I think um, I have personally learned so much from. So I'm just so thrilled to have you on board and involved in um, in the book and, and contributing the great essay that, that sort of opens our book. So thank you, Mark. Um, I guess uh, we could probably, well, just before we go on to the slides, I want to acknowledge that we're all wearing hats today, which is, <laughs> which is uh, in my case, it's the Toronto Raptors here. It's our basketball team. But I'm also acknowledging that I'm talking to uh, three folks in the UK. This is a, a sweater by Grace Wales Bonner, who is uh, one of your great designers over there. So I'm trying to give a little bit and keep a little for myself here. All right. So maybe we could go to the slides. Yeah. Um, I'm a dentist in Toronto, a dentist who started collecting uh, works that meant something to me early on. So probably for 25 years, I've been collecting uh, art that focuses on Black identity, on Black life uh, globally. And um, when I was a 10-year-old, uh, my parents were Jamaican immigrants to Canada, um, early immigrants, um, you know, came to a small town called Windsor across from Detroit, Michigan. It's actually the southernmost Canadian the city close to Toronto and um, they they would often take us to galleries I was very lucky to grow up in a household where uh, they felt it was important not just to go to the football match or to go and you know to some you know see playmates and so forth but also to kind of do do um, you know visits to art galleries to libraries to see concerts and so at the Detroit Institute of Arts, I remember seeing this image by James Van Der Zee, uh, the couple in raccoon coats. It's a 1930s image from the Harlem Renaissance. And I just wasn't seeing images of African-Americans certainly um, looking like this when I was growing up in the 70s um, in, in the place that I was in the world. Uh, so this is just an image that burned in my brain as a 10 year old, you know, sophistication, the, the, the beautiful fashion, the white wall tires on this Cadillac, the beautiful brownstones of Harlem. And, um, you know, it, it made an impression. And I think um, as I got older, I realized I wanted to have a longer conversation than just seeing works in a gallery, in a magazine. Uh, there was no internet then, but I would see images. And at a certain point, when I graduated from dental school, I started buying work that uh, meant something to me particularly works from local artists. And then it expanded into a kind of a global um, process with the Wedge Gallery, a wedge-shaped space in my home. We did these Sunday afternoon salons and then it morphed into a curatorial project, Wedge Curatorial Projects, that is sort of a nonprofit where we think about um, the presence of Black Canadian artists increasingly. So it's a lot like Mark's autograph in London uh, on a smaller scale. And then, um, and the other stream of my life became a personal collection, the wedge collection. And there's this double meaning, um, trying to wedge artists into the mainstream and into the story of contemporary art. So the next slide uh, should come up in a moment. I think it's taking a moment to, to load. But the next slide uh, shows some work in my um, dental office it's by Jamel Shabazz. And then um, the other image shows work by Zavira Simmons. We had a great talk with those two artists a couple of weeks ago. Um, while that loads, I will say about the book, As We Rise, the title was taken from a phrase that my late father would always uh, go on about. He would always say, lifting as we rise, which I think you know referred to the fact that as you do well, you've got to pull up other people in your own community. And uh, there go the slides. And um, I think that's an apt metaphor for, you know, how I feel about the artists in the collection. I think Aperture recognized that. Um, 
and, and also the subtitle uh, photographs from the Black Atlantic, I think that also has a, um, you know, a reference to the fact that almost all of the work in my Wedge collection has to do with artistic practices that are peripheral to the Atlantic, uh, the UK, which we'll focus on today, uh, the African continent itself, South America, the Caribbean, United States and Canada. So that that you know sort of gives the frame of of the uh, of the book, and then we chose to look at the works in the collection through this lens of community, identity, and power. So there's your cover with varied images um, uh, from my my collection, which is mostly photography. We can move to the next slide. Um, community and uh, community for me is everything from a community of one to thinking about how we are in the world uh, and the planet itself and, and how we intend to save the planet. So community is a very wide brass road. I mean, community is, is everything for me. Um, while we wait for those to, to uh, come up and load, I can talk about identity, uh, which is the next section. And identity for me really was inspired by artists in the 90s um, like Glenn Ligon and Lorna Simpson, who are in my collection, and and um, and then realizing that there were also great works being done by Black Canadian artists and artists abroad. Uh, here's work by uh, Eileen Perrier, who I believe worked with you at one point, Mark. I remember meeting her when she worked at, at Autograph, but is a great artist in her own right. And I remember seeing this work in uh, Africa Remix. Uh, Simon and Jamie's great show. I think I saw it in uh, Paris at the Pompidou, though it was also at the Hayward in London. And I remember loving this work. And I think, you know, it became a very cheeky, funny uh, kind of series that I had for, for many years up in the waiting room of my dental office because it was, you know, it's, it's called Grace. The artist's mother is on the lower right. Uh, her name is Grace. But these um, subjects are all friends of... Eileen's, uh, her art teacher, her best friend, uh, a cousin, and you know everyone sort of chose uh, told to pose in a state of grace. So it's sort of a play on words, but it's about sameness and difference, as you can tell. And of course, they all have the gap between their front teeth, as does the artist. So it's a bit of a self-portrait and worked very well in my dental clinic. Um, moving to the next slide, um, power. Uh, is I think our focus today and power um, may be the most important section for me uh, in the book because while I grew up thinking so much about community and identity, I think my collecting has moved very much to be thinking about power and I mean black power in the sense of you know traditionally civil rights to you know black power movements that I grew up with in the 70s to to Black Lives Matter now, and then thinking about the different iterations, the different ways that we think about power, how we have um, had power taken from us, how we've reclaimed it. Um, and, and, and this is a global uh, uh, initiative in my, my collection. We're thinking about the many ways of being Black, or as, as, as Stuart Hall would say, uh, being and becoming. And I think power is uh, increasingly uh, the important lens for me. Uh, there is a lot of work by Black Canadian artists in the collection. Uh, it's my special love. Uh, the work on the left is by Camille Turner and Cabal Prabai. And it's uh, basically thinking about, um, well, using the text uh, from a wanted poster. That is a wanted slave poster. And yes, we had slavery in Canada that ended several years before the United States, but was just as vicious and just as much trauma for the community and and taking these words, uh, you know, light colored uh, quote, you know, with a red cape, a waistcoat and breeches. This was language that was used in an ad in a Canadian newspaper in Montreal that was, you know, uh, put in as an advertisement to, you know, in, in, an ad to look for runaway slaves. And she's sort of, you know, um, Camille and, 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 Kam and um, Kamal are rethinking uh, how to just to, to sort of show that ad and doing it like a modern ad, like a, for the Gap or for a retailer and thinking about the clothing uh, that that person's wearing and how we see um, that, that individual now in terms of a power position, he controls his own destiny as a Black Canadian. Uh, the image on the right, of course, is iconic from Renee Cox, who's a Jamaican artist based in New York. Uh, and she is uh, embodying 
one of Jamaica's national heroes, uh, Nanny of the Maroons. Uh, and um, I think a lot of ways, this is uh, one of Renee's most powerful series. Um, she is actually um, taking on that uh, hero strength and, and, and thinking about um, Nanny of the Maroons. Uh, there are equivalents, I'm sure, throughout the Caribbean, um, Mazalie and Trinidad and so forth. This is, this is the, the story of someone who led enslaved people uh, to freedom and, and hid in the, in the mountains in uh, the central part of Jamaica. And so, you know, she's a national hero. And I think it's also emblemic of Renee's practice where she is taking on various positions of power uh, uh, and thinking about black women now in this moment. Next slide. Um, the last image in the book, actually, uh, which has um, got a beautiful extended caption from my friend Zoe Whitley, um, um, is, is really a still a work from, from Horace Ove, who's well known as a filmmaker, but also a wonderful photographer. Um, he got himself in front of uh, brothers from the Black House. Uh, Michael X, uh, you know, who was coming off a train with his bodyguards at Paddington Station. You can see the, the looks from the white folks on the far left and how everyone is just stunned seeing this entourage of powerful Black men. Um, this, this image uh, would have been 1960s, 67, I believe. And um, this is a, a group that would be affiliated with the Black Panthers in America. And a very interesting story behind it, which maybe Mark um, can... can um, elaborate on, but Horace is one of um, England's national treasures, one of Tr Trinidad's national treasures. Uh, his son, Zach Ove, uh, has a great work in Toronto right now in a show called Fragments of Epic Memory done by Julie Crooks and thinks about Caribbean art. So everything's going full circle and next generation with Horace and uh, thrilled to end the book uh, on such a powerful note. So uh, I would think I will turn things over to our next speaker, who will be Van Lee Burke. Thank you. Uh, good evening, and thanks for inviting me to this session. Um, it's a pleasure. Um, I remember the last time we met, um, Ken, is um, when we were, I was in Canada at the Contact Photo Festival a few years ago. So briefly, my name is Van Lee Burke. My idea of um, engaging in photography was about how do I document the struggles and experience that we as a people were having in establishing ourselves in, within this um, foreign land. And um, I started in the late 60s and um, I've continued till today. The photograph um, in uh, we're looking at at the moment, um, boy with flag or boy with a flag, which is sometimes known as um, was taken in uh, Hansworth Park around 1970. And on this occasion, it was a Saturday morning, I'd finished my chores and we had a family shop and I'd gone out just looking, walking around the community. And I saw um, this young man, Winfred, um, on his bike with a little dog running behind him, um, riding through the park. And for me, it was quite astonishing to see a young man with a black with a, a, a young black kid with a, with a Union Jack. Because at the time, the idea of identity um, belonging uh, was a, a massive question in our, in our eyes. I, I sort of equated to the, the Irish uh, sort of issue where I imagined a young Catholic boy riding in Belfast, you know, with a Union Jack on his bike. You know, that's how strong I felt about this photograph because at the time, as I said, you know, the idea of belonging and identity was very, very much in our mind. But I took a few photographs of him as he rode through the park. And then I asked if I could take this one of him where he, I posed him. And I was quite determined that the horizon of the flag should be on, on the horizon um, in, in the background. The middle of the flag should be in the horizon in the background and that his head should be in the corner. So it's a little bit like the points, both the horizon and the the paving going up sort of lies right behind his head, focusing on him. But the story behind it, he had made this bike himself, the bicycle from parts he had found. And he went to a shop uh, to find something to decorate the bike. And he had the choice of the flag or uh, a windmill, he said. And he chose the flag because 
he felt it wouldn't fall off the bike. And it was as simple as that is reason for, for um, choosing the, this flag. I am very much in touch with him. I photographed him on, on many occasions, including the occasion where his son was shot um, in, in Birmingham here and his mother who died recently, I, I've seen him. So that's something that for me is, is, is kind of like an ongoing process in the photographs that I take. I don't really just take the photographs and leave the people behind. I, engage with their lives throughout. So I might find them, you know, he's a, he's, a, he's a grandfather now, but I'm still in contact with him. And I do like that relationship that we developed with him. Um, it has been written and used quite a lot as you, 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 you probably can imagine. And, um, you know, I, I'd like to say thank you for acquiring this for your, your collection. And just to say that there are many more um, in the collection that I'm sure you would want to look at at some time in the future. Thank you. I think we're going to go over to Richard now. Hi. Sorry, Richard. I'm waiting for the slide to come up. There we go. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hello. Hi. I am. You guys hearing me? We can hear you. Okay, great. Okay, well, first of all, um, thanks to, to our chair, Dr. Ken, everybody, um, Mark, and um, for having me here. Um, it's really, I feel really honored to be in this place talking with Van Lee as well, you know, uh, about my work, and it's part of my research that I have been doing. And to just get into it about empowerment. So empowerment, the image that you're seeing there is one of four images and a video that I created. And it's based on um, an essay I came across by Stuart Hall called Old and New Et Identities, Old and New Ethnicities. It was written in 1991, I believe. And in it, Hall, um, a master wordsmith, you know, says that I am the sugar at the bottom of the English cup of tea. I am the sweet tooth, the sugar plantations that rotted generations of English children's tea. There are thousands of others beside me that are, you know, the cup of tea itself because they don't grow it in Lancashire, you know, not a single tea plantation exists within the United Kingdom. This is the symbolization of English identity. I mean, what does anybody in the world know other than English person except that they can't get through the day without a cup of tea? And I thought this was so brilliant because it, it fits directly with the research that I've done in terms of tracing my own identity across the Atlantic and back again. And since coming to live here in 2017, my work has focused on connecting with my Black British cousins who I haven't met until now. And one of the things that I'm always searching for are the connections to the Caribbean, the connections to Britain, the connections to Africa. Reversing the, reversing the triangle, as they say. And this work was born out of that moment. It just sparked, um, it just sparked something inside of me to create the image. And it's taken a life of its own since it first showed in Get Up Stand Up, um, which was a celebration of the work of Horace Ove, who's also a major influence for me. And then I didn't see what was coming in 2020, I guess, like a lot of us. And by the time 2020 came around and the Black Lives Matter movement um, got up to speed, the image actually started recirculating with a new verve, I guess, a new, a new impetus, a new cause celebre, you know. And I think that's one of the wonderful things about making work. You put work out into the world with a meaning that you've seen or something that you decide to do with it. And then ultimately, once the viewer connects with it, they bring something else to it. And I think that's been the greatest appeal. And I'm really happy that it's part of the Wedge Collection. I mean, it's my second outing with the Wedge Collection, I believe, yes. And um, I'm really glad that it has a, a place in the collection, especially at this time, when it means so much. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs>
I've got another. There's Richard. I waited for you to react there. <laughs> yeah, that's the first work that's in the collection from your Finding Black series, which I think is also extraordinary. Yeah. So, thank mm -hmm. you for for uh, all that you do, Richard. You know, a great artist. You're you're on your way, my man. Can I um just try and join the conversation a little bit? Can I think um it is a an, an, an outstanding and kind of um, resilient piece of work that you've done in terms of focusing and collecting it's very easy especially as the as the decades roll by to lose direction in terms of a collection likewise with an artist I think it's very easy to be pulled into the various kind of strains and, and veins that you feel as though your work should be going into so I guess one of the key and, and I remember you know leaving leaving art school in like 85 and you know, general, there, there was a the, the people were making work trying to talk about you know the black experience or black experiences, and constantly being you know refused even a conversation because the work was often criticised as simply been too didactic, right? Talking about a single seemingly issue, yeah. talking about things which were not which didn't have which the museums and spaces didn't have an audience for. And you'll remember this very, very well, Van Lee, in terms of the UK, how difficult it was once you'd kind of graduated from school. People like Maxine Walker, who we know very well, it was almost impossible to find a place to even have a conversation with the work about. It was almost as if, if you graduated, you were lucky. And if you could find the idea of a career within the arts, it was almost, well, like, how would that be? Almost an impossibility. And it's interesting that, so although the, although the theme tonight is power, I also want to talk about resilience. And mm -hmm. the question is really probably aimed first at Vanley, this idea of, you know, what, what is the driver? How do we keep, you know, what is it that kind of fuels the ambition or the desire to keep kind of going, especially, especially, especially when we've seen, you know, generations, whether it's Thatcherism, whether it's new labor, whether it's, you know, art institutions which refuse to have the conversation. How does this resilience, where does this resilience, you know, where, where is this charge from? Vanley, please. Well, I, I, I think I, I think my interest in, 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 in Black culture, if you like, or in, in, in just Black people was born out of a conversation or perhaps not so much a conversation, but I was read to us at, at kindergarten while I was a child in Jamaica. And um, we heard about the Morant Bay Rebellion. And this is where a lot of people, this is really in my neck of the woods. And the story went about how a lot of the people were hiding in caves and escaping these white folks. And I heard about slavery. I was very young at the time as you can imagine. And I remember thinking I would love to find a cave with these people in there. And I think from then, but then there was a massive loss for me as well when my mother came to England when I was about three years old. So there was always this connection with England. Um, then my grandparents came to England five years after them and I lived with an aunt. So there was my district where I was born with most of the people in England. And there was this longing for them. What is this place we called England that they all have gone to? And our only connections were the photographs they would send back or the letters. And as children, we really didn't engage with any of those. We really just listened, eavesdrop on conversation somewhere um, along the line. So when I came here, I really wanted to hear the stories of the people. And while I realized everyone had a story, not everyone was a storyteller. And I wasn't hearing what I thought was the full story. While this was happening, I realized also that the press was quite negative towards us. And we had set up some, I say we members of the community had set up some uh, self-help organizations, you know, in terms of education, social health, mental health, and all of that sort of thing. And I got engaged with that, not, not I wasn't in the center of it. I was more an observer all the while of these things. But I remember making the decision that if we, and, and the information was not freely available, I couldn't pick up the phone and talk to you guys anywhere, you know, we didn't have those facilities, internet and all of that obviously wasn't there. So I made a conscious decision that if we are to solve this problem, then sacrifices have to be made. And I decided that I would spend, I, 
I think I might be able to tell you within three meters um, the space I stood when I had just picked up my Saturday magazines, um, photographic magazines, when I thought I was going to photograph the lives and experience of Black people. And also the work that I couldn't uh, photograph, I would collect, and hence the collection. So I start, well, I had previously started taking the photograph. And the resilience for me is the determinant, as I said, that sacrifice has to be made. I felt I had to leave something that people can build on. You know, you had to dig deep to present, to, to create, if you like, a foundation that won't be washed away within the first gush of rain or water storm or whatever. So I basically continued. And there have been difficult times, you know, um, absolutely difficult times. Um, my friend once told me the only job I didn't do was grave digging. But I did pretty well everything else um, in order to, to, to do the photography. And it's been um, the times when I remember there was one occasion I had been divorced and I'd moved into this flat where I'm at the moment. And I thought to myself, how about, I mean, who knows? Why am I taking this photograph? Who, who put me in charge in this position to photograph the community? And what is the community? What constitute a community? And what aspect of it? Why am I, who, you know, who knows I'm doing it? And I just thought, well, if I were to, announcing one of the papers here, let's say The Voice or Caribbean Times or one of those black newspaper, that I was going to be, I will be, Van der Berg will be burning all his negative in Hansworth Park at 12 o'clock on the 10th of June, who would care? So I remember thinking that, and I thought to myself, I went, I was walking through Hansworth Park and I was talking to this young man who knew rather a lot about my work. And I mentioned that to him and he says, they're not yours to burn. And for mm -hmm. me, that solved a lot of the problem. That meant I was carrying on, if you like, on the same, on, on, on a track that I, right. you know, it was encouraging to realize that they're not mine. I was only the custodian, if you like, of, of, of this material. I, um, I, like the, I like the idea of the, the custodian, Vanley. I think that's a very important point where you realize that you are more than the sum of the things that we people frame us for. And that's yes. a really important part. Really important part. I just wanted to bring Richard into the conversation as well mm. because obviously there's a there's a generational shift and people have relocated. But I think this idea of I mean your work has been that I mean you know the the black yeah. fist and the teacup and Stuart's quote. Yeah. I mean it's a it's a triangle in itself of a of a, yeah. of a bringing together of very very specific ideas, colonial ideas, resistance ideas, and intellectual ideas, which is a, a very successful image. I mean, I just want to know, you know, where this idea of power power fits within your work generically, if you like. Well, I think I think once you recenter, once once as black people recenter yourself within the image, that's that's it right there, in a sense. Um, one of the things that I've been working on is this, another series called Conversations Over Tea, where um, a lot of black British artists that I've met here. Um, since I've been here, we've been having discussions and I've been photographing them by actually having them drink from a cup of tea. And the, the, the teacup actually looks like what you would think an English teacup looks like. But what I do is I actually center the image on them and have the cup of tea out, um, almost blown out in some cases. So you know they're drinking from a cup, but the center returns to this individual looking squarely into the, the camera. And the images say a lot without actually having to spell it out or say anything. And I think for me, what I'm interested in is um, taking the image and recentering that, recentering that that black body in that position. It's one of the reasons I used um, my own hand in the shooting of that that series because one, you're the person that you know better than anybody else, and in a form. It's you telling your own story from your own place on your own terms and somebody's not telling that story for you. And I think that's one of the things that um, always taken by when I see Fan Lee's work, um, Neil Kenlock's work, of course, Horace Ove's work, um, the work of Poga Caesar, and of course, people like Jamal Shabazz, is that they're actually telling their stories and basically bringing the power back to the image. So it's not somebody else controlling that narrative or telling that story, but basically they're recentering the subject in a way that the, the subject then isn't just the object, you understand? The subject is the main thing, but they have that agency. And I think that's what I've been trying to do with the work that I've been creating 
in terms of the, the photographic works that I'm doing. I think that's great. The, the critical question for me as well underneath this is that Van Lee, we've spoke over, over, over many times, and there are times when the work feels urgent, and there are times when the work feels as if it's just been cast aside. And I'm very mindful of how political circles work. We seem to be back in an urgent time. Mm -hmm. And I'm a little bit worried that the circle is already shifting towards less focus on the issue, if you like, around Black Lives Matter and Black empowerment. I'm wondering whether, the, whether, whether it's possible through our work to keep the focus in play, whether that's possible to keep this idea of black empowerment in play. And then if it is, what would that legacy be in relation to the institutions that are, that are, that are out there, our own personal lives? And what does it say to those in the communities that are out there who might resist the idea that we need to continuously at the moment narrate, as you rightly say, Richard, this idea that this, this, the place of black empowerment is feels to me still a very precarious place. I, I don't think you should feel too precarious about it really. I mean, in terms of, I mean, I, I really photographic primarily one geographic space, although some of the photographs were taken in different spaces and in fact, different countries. I mean, one of the things I constantly have, um, and I, I would do initially, my first exhibition, Hands With From Inside, I was due to be shown at the Icon Gallery, but I first felt the need to show it to the community first. We are not people who are used to being photographed, and a lot of us have looked suspiciously on the camera. And so I felt that I need not to get them to, um, to approve what I've done necessarily, but if you like, just to show them what I was taking away to show others about them. So I had the, the exhibition first at a school hall in, in, um, in Hansworth, prior to it going to the Icon Gallery. Um, I just feel that whenever I go out now, um, I get many people and even much, much more people who constantly say the importance, please carry on with the work. The importance of the work is, is incredible. Don't, you know, I meet people who say without the photographs, I wouldn't be able to tell my children about my history. Mm -hmm. You know, when is your next exhibition? When's your next book? Where can I see your work, more of your work? You know, I, I, I'm really, I mean, I had, I had an exhibition at the MAC a, a few years back, um, um, the Rivers of Birmingham. And as part of that, I also always include the community. So I would have the exhibition there, but I had a trail within the community where I would have pictures in the church, in the pubs, in the hairdressers, in the food shops and so on. And in one food shop, I remember this young man um, coming to me and he said, the, the owner of the shop, he said, after the, 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 the restaurant had closed, seven of them were in the shop and they spent two hours talking about the photograph. And they came to the conclusion, which of my photograph was the best. Now that wouldn't have taken place anywhere else, in a book, in a gallery or anywhere else. So right. there is always this contact, you know, this, you know, it's, it's, it's incredible how much needed it is. I don't think we need to worry about it. Um, I never really, as you might know, Mark, photograph for the critics, you know, I'm not bothered about them. I mean, I appreciate you, you know, taking the photographs and I did talk about, you know, there are others to buy. But I really didn't particularly care if anyone bought them. I didn't even particularly care if anyone saw them. The important thing was to document them so that future generation will have that material to have a Great. look at. Great, Vanny. Vanny, I'm going to pause you there because I'm just okay. going to I think that's, that's a really, no, 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 we're going to come back. That's a really important point about the word there is care. I think that's mm -hmm. a really important point. Not that you didn't care. Actually, I would argue that you super cared mm -hmm. beyond the normal parameters of what what one should care about you cared about the core values of what the work was doing but we can come back to that yeah Richard I just wanted th this idea because I think you, you know within that particular image the black fist yeah. it's now very iconic it's been rolling around the world now since you know the 1960s black power you yeah. know Stokely Carmichael the fist mm -hmm. has been there it's been used in pop records t-shirts etc etc I wonder whether that whether I wonder how we employ that and whether critical question backs. So I think one of the things I'll do as well, like is try and create a critical conversation about yeah. the things that we make as well. Whether we feel as though that that that, that iconic fist 
still has that sense of um, what's the word penetration and purpose. I think so. Um, I mean, 2020 showed you that. And when I talk about 2020, I talk about the Black Lives Matter movement, you know, rolling out across the world. And um, in in the Human Touch, I actually wrote an essay where I spoke about the fist, and I talked about the that that idea of the the fist and what the fist symbolized in terms of power and empowerment and what the fist meant and for me it was a full circle connection you know they say that um sometimes things don't change right history repeats itself and when you when you take the most iconic the most iconic image of the fist which would have been john carlos and tommy on the podium you know, with the black glove, Mexico, and the, the edge bowed, right? That sets up that sets up a whole narrative that runs straight through resistance in sports, um, the civil rights movement, the women's movement. Every agency that you can think of that needed to reclaim itself, and then here we get back to twenty twenty, and it becomes the symbol of a new movement which has to respond to all things. And I think in a sense, it was one, it was one of the reasons I, I was a bit taken aback by how I created the image in, in 2019 with one expectation of where the image would go. And then by 2020, the image actually meant something else. For, for the show Get Up, Stand Up, I, I remember the, the show opening on the opening night and I walked into the motherland room, which was the room that that was in. And um, there were all these people around the image with their cell phones out and everybody is taking an image. And I have the, the picture of, I have a picture of all these people with images, you know, with cell phones out and you're seeing these little fists on the phones, right? And then I, I go back home and my Instagram starts blowing up and I have messages from random people basically telling me, what seeing that image meant and they they bought out the postcards and, and and they give it to their kids they some framed it some have it on the fridge at home and i still get messages about what the image meant and i think at that point i realized that you put something out there and there's a power that is actually greater than what you think and i think 20 it had 2020 not happened the way it did i think that work as it is may have gone in a, a different direction. It may have been more uh, academic reflection of Hall's essay or discussions around what, um, what Black people mean within um, Britain or what English identity means. But in a sense, it encapsulated a lot of, a lot of, a lot of concerns and global concerns at the same time. Great, Richard, great. I've got about five minutes before we open it up to some Q&A from mm. the floor. Kenneth, I mean, it, I, I, I'm, I'm wondering when the collection became a collection, if you like. I'm wondering whether there was a, you know, there comes a point where I'm buying what I like and then there is the collection all of a sudden. I mean, there's, there's a point where, I mean, you'll also understand this as well, Van, you realize that actually there's a body of things here which I am responsible for. And a little bit like an artist with a body of work, it's like, what, what do we do with it? And the hardest part, I think one of the hardest parts is how does this transition into a form of institution that people can reference to? This question of care again comes into the play. How do we care for it post our legacies, if you like? Van Lee, God forbid, you know, but we don't live forever, Kenneth, likewise. The, the thing is, is what do we prepare ourselves for? The future of the things that we've invested so much in. How do we protect these characteristics around the work that we've done so that we, so that the generations behind us don't have to reset and restart. And this is what I mean by the 10 year cycle, if you like. It seems to me that there's a degree of resetting and restart, re restarting because if you like the in institutional infrastructures have not quite embraced the work that we've been doing collectively, if you like, both as artists, as collectors, as kind of, if you like, uh, ambassadors for social change collectively across the way that the visual world is made up. Because it seems to me the responsibility that you've taken with on all of yourselves is this idea that we're going to leave something in the world that changes mm -hmm. the dynamic of how people understand the question of blackness, right? So Kenneth, how do we, the, what is the next stage, if you like, 
of the work and how do we protect it, leave it behind. And I think obviously publishing is a is an absolutely critical part of that. Oh, wow, what a question. Um, <clears throat> I must say that, uh, you know, my personal mission after many years of collecting now is I see things from a different perspective, having spent time on the Tate Africa Acquisitions Committee in London and seeing things from an international perspective, it, it made it even more important and urgent for me that I go back to my, my hometown of Toronto and, and make sure that the institutions here, that would be the Art Gallery of Ontario and so forth, that we actually start really collecting, questioning, and, and exploring the stories about our own Black community. So for me, it's about legacy and the legacy is about home. So, you know, and then and then everything from there kind of relates to the, and the, the work start coming together and building a collection with that as the sort of foundation. It's this idea of um, sameness and difference. So I think about uh, the fact that so many works, maybe dis disproportionate amount of works in my collection are by UK artists. And, and I think that that Black British art movement um, of which, Mark, you're such an integral part of um, celebrating, protecting this legacy. Those images like Van Lee Burke's image of Boy and Flag completely speak to me as a Black Canadian, remembering that there's this strange and dramatic legacy of colonialism that, that I share with you all as a, as a Black Canadian. You know, my parents coming from the Caribbean, they're in that same Windrush generation where uh, siblings of theirs went to the UK. There's that crazy and horrible triangle of, you know, with trading people for goods and all of that, you know, Canada, Canada's implicit in that with, you know, the codfish coming down to Jamaica and our national dish, Appian codfish is Canadian cod, you know, and then enslaved people came up to, to Canada and United States and rum was going to England and sugar. And it, it's just this, you know, this, this long legacy of slavery that we're pulling forward and thinking about that always at the root of these images. I mean, Van Lee Burke's image starts the book. Horace Obey's image ends the book. Like I, I feel this connection um, and, and, and it became very clear to me um, meeting Thelma Golden from the Studio Museum many years ago, where she said to me, Ken, you're, you're taking this wedge project and bringing works from around the world to Toronto. You know, you're making the global local. Now it's time for you to think about making the local global. And that really resonated with me. I had wanted to do it. I needed Thelma to sort of give me a, a kick in the butt to sort of start sharing our own story. So for me, the legacy starts with home and this idea of home locally and globally. All those images in that book works in my collection. I see as uh, it, one thing in, in a way, it's, it's expressions of black life uh, through the world that we all can relate to. The regional differences start to meld away and we start thinking about uh, how we are moving forward as we rise as a people. There are questions, uh, thanks Ken. I mean, I think it's really, really, really important to kind of like contextualize that connectivity, if you like, and move past the kind of geographies of existence into a more kind of human connectivity across that. Because I mean, there, there are many shared narratives across that and those narratives are, nuanced if you like i do like the idea i mean there are a couple of questions for van lee which are i mean they are kind of answered in the book people want to know a little bit about winfred's story winfred's i mean i i we, we write extensively about Win, Win, winfred's um winfred's journey and it's a what i like about that though is that it's not a single moment it's an ongoing conversation and i think that's what's important i think about about that photograph also one of the things i think just just in terms of winfred's work i like what's outside the frame of that work because what people have to realize actually and one of the things I wanted to talk about in terms of a photograph like that is that that bike for me is an escape route. And that flag for me is like a red rag. That bike for me is not just a symbol of pleasure. Young black kids had bikes to get away from things, right? To move yeah. fast and fluid through the world. They're almost like vehicles of security, if you like. It's a place of escape. It's a place of being. It's a place of freedom. The idea that black people can move through this world in safe passage is exactly what that bike represents to me. And the one thing I like about that photograph so much is that each time I come to it, I can think about a different discourse through it as, we, as, as it opens up so many doors to different kind of 
black cosmologies in terms of our thinking. Whether it's a mistake or a degree of purposeness, the idea of flying the flag and the right to fly the flag and the right to be who you want to be is essentially at the core of that work. And I think that also joins Richard's work together as well. And also, I think fundamentally, the right to collect. Some of these questions here as well about what can educators do? Educators, in my view, take responsibility, do the work, read the yeah. work, engage the artist, work, share yeah. the love. Don't expect black practitioners to come in there and answer Good all the you. questions, right? Yeah. Do the heavy lifting, the work. get the drum work in, the way that people like Vanley and Richard have done and Ken have done in their communities. Go out there, solve the problems, and most of all, be generous. And young practitioners, I think both Richard, Ken, and Mark, is just reading these questions out there. It's really important that you follow the path, if you like. Do the thing that you need to do. Don't be framed by anything other than your, on your own desire. And there's me more than anybody is a huge fan of the capacity to be abstracted in your blackness, right? The end of the essential black subject is upon us, but we must have these interconnected conversations across gender, across class, across race, across place, across the imagination, it's really important. So I'm gonna leave the, the, the space really with Richard. What advice do you give to a young artist now? Do the work. Just do the work. Do the work. <laughs> do the work. What advice to young artists now? I would say get rid of your television, get rid of some of your social media uh, or most of it, and um, just concentrate. Don't 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 do the work to suit, suit any gallery, any individual, yeah. any critics. You should be your worst and best critic, and just put your head down and focus. Good. Yeah. Yeah. And we have to remember that a lot of the work that's actually been collected over the years and, and been purchased now was critic less. No one even wanted to have the conversation, right? Yeah. No one wanted to see it. It was actually marginalized. It was shown in community spaces. And the conversations, sometimes very difficult, as Vanny will, will testify, even internally were robust really robust places of thinking. You know, who are you to have the right to represent? Who is this black subject? What does blackness mean? Black, I think we have to keep on asking the questions, but keep on doing what I fundamentally am proud of at the work at Autograph and through artists like Richard and Vanny is they're making progress. We must make collections, we must make work, and we must have the opportunities to amplify them in the world. Otherwise, we're silenced. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I agree with you 100%. And, you know, the most important thing, we never know where this work leads. It. I say I make a piece of work and I put it out there and I don't do anything. I don't, um, I don't seek exhibitions. My work, I just follow the work around. And I get young people who download for, to photographs from the internet of their younger selves, and they use it for discussion every month, you know, around themselves. We have all sort of engagement. The most important thing is just do the work. It will find its own level. It will find its space. Yeah. In Kemp, it must, it's, a, it's a great legacy then, because one of the things that I think is, again, really important, Vanley and I published a book in 1993. It was one of the first things I wanted to do when I got to Autograph. I wanted to establish this idea that the ISBN number on a book goes to the British Library. We didn't have the place to collect. You can leave things behind in places that mm -hmm. logistically and legally they have to take on board. So yeah. I think the idea of bringing the collection to publication is a tour de force. Yes. It will live there forever. Like Vanley's book in 93, people are still discovering it, reworking in it. And we had conversations about, you know, sweet fly paper in life. We had conversations about poetry and words. We had conversations about captions, no captions. We had conversations about who writes, who says, who speaks. But guess what? Even in those early days, there's still something for people to turn the pages over and yeah. still find and still discover, even if not all the answers are there. It's a magic place, the publishing world, of disco not discovery, but a magic place of making. And I think I just really want to encourage people to carry on that making process, because without that, there is no collection. And without that, there is no, photo no photographic place. And without that, there is no conversation. So it's that making process that is really essential to, to that sense of being in this thing. So as we rise, Ken, I'd like to thank you really for doing that and having the vision to have that conversation. And thank God for dad <laughs> who reminded you to make sure that he hands on that legacy because actually what the collection has done, it's helped a lot of photographers rise because it brings curators to their work and it helps them focus on the work and also move the work into different places. 
Well, thank you, Mark. And I, I will I'll end by saying that uh, we're going to take it to another dimension. And I'm just working on an associated exhibition uh, with featuring the works from the book that will open at the Art Gallery at the University of Toronto uh, next fall, so 2022, September, and then move on to spring 2023 to the Polygon, which is a dedicated photography center in Vancouver. So, and, and hopefully on and on, hopefully in London sometime too. So we're gonna try to make this work live on um, in book form, but also in an exhibition. I think it's so important to, to be there and see and feel the work, to have it, you know, not just on some Instagram post, you know, it's really, it's essential to sort of, you know, feel the work, be present with it. So I, I'm, I'm very happy about that development, that there'll be an exhibition. And, and of course, I'm a book lover, as all, all four of us are. So so uh, thanks to Aperture for, for reaching and out I, about that. And I think one of the things is that when you're standing in front of the work, that there is a kind of resonance that you can have with it. There is a time issue, isn't there? There's the kind of materiality of the image and the kind of just being in its presence, which has a certain magic around it you know it's not Absolutely. just about turning the page someone's printed this thing there is the object of the moment in front of you and you know time and time again as I say when you come back to a photograph when you have the opportunity to view things in collections it's quite it's quite amazing how you can not think you, you think you know something but keep on coming back to it and that's what I really would like to encourage those that are tuned into and ourselves to keep on thinking through the process of what it means to produce images to talk to, if you like, black experiences, you know. And I still, one of the things that Vanley said when he did the BBC radio program, he does Island Discs, is that, you know, one of the partly, partly just to be on a little bit more melancholic edge of it, the work is pressing that we do, that you do, all of you, because, you know, this sense of race and racism and having to wake up and be confronted with other people's prejudice is part of our reality. And we have to not let that you know, we have to make people understand that we are still, many people are still dealing with a, those old fashioned racist scenarios that keep on coming up and simply won't go away as we're discovering time after time after time. So the work is pressing and it's urgent and it's absolutely necessary that it's collected, shown, publicized and amplified in any possible way. If I might just add briefly, um, um, you know, we talked about collecting and you talked about the legacy, what happens to it. Well, you can see behind me, there are some of my negatives um, in boxes. I'm in the process of archiving that material at the moment, but I also have a house that's absolutely full. And if I get a book in the post, I can't find the space to put it. I collect ephemera, and for me, those ephemera are about contextualizing the photographs that we have. It is not just about the photograph. I wanted to leave more of a complete package. So it wouldn't, I have a very vast vinyl collection, a lot of videotapes um, collection, old videotapes that we recorded, cassette tapes that we recorded. Um, in fact, one, one of my friends, she hates going into my living room. She says it's full of dead people, something. <laughs> and again, the publication, Mark, I think is essential because, um, I, I, you know, I did um, the entire contents of the flat was on exhibition at the Icon Gallery. We made a catalogue and that was sold out. The, 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 the catalogue that was made for the Rivers of Birmingham was sold out and reprinted and it sold out again and they're thinking of reprinting it. That gives me the confidence to know that there are individuals outside there who want this information. So I'm not in any doubt about it. It might not be in my lifetime that they reach it, but I'm trying to, as you see, archive the material so that it will be available for a, a greater future. Brilliant. Well, listen, I'm gonna, it's my job, I think, to um, wrap up. I think the archive is the critical question. I think how we care for those ephemera is a critical question. I think generations of artists, we know, as we say, we can't live forever. So it's really important that there is care in place for that stuff. And the other word just to think on tonight is value. Just value that stuff, really important. Because you realize just how, what's the word, how rare it is, right? Because if we don't value it, nobody else does. If Van Lee hadn't collected all that material, it would be gone. It's mm -hmm. so easy to throw mm -hmm. things out. There's so many parts of black creative life that get trashed, thrown mm -hmm. out because those that come to see and look simply can't value it. It's not worth collecting in that, in that sense. So this sense of value, again, Kenneth, is really, really, really important. So I think I'm going to summarize and say, Kenneth, 
may your star keep on rising. <laughs> Vanley, may your collection keep on growing. Mm -hmm. And Richard, may the fist just get bigger. <laughs> and thank you all really for participating tonight. And thanks, of course, to Aperture for having the foresight to bring this collection to a much wider community of photographic lovers. And I think the work that Aperture does is incredibly outstanding. So thank you very much, Denise. Thank and all you thank so you. much for having this conversation. I don't want it to end, but as you said, these interconnected conversations are carried forth by the work of artists um, and also the work of this book, which is available now after some shipping delays. Um, so please go out and check it out. And also please join us for our next conversation on December 9th um, around this book. It's, it was a beautiful, inspiring uh, conversation in the afternoon here in New York and Canada <laughs> and evening uh, elsewhere. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Denise. Thanks, everybody. And good night. Thanks, everybody. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Good night. I love you guys. Thank you, guys. Yeah, yeah. Thank you.